2011 uh, annual Jan Rathieu Democracy Award workshop. Uh, I was here at the inception uh, seven years ago, so this is a very important event for the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, the purpose of the Jan Rathieu Democracy Award is to bring visibility and international recognition to the ideas and accomplishments of individuals around the world who are working on behalf of democracy. Um, the event expresses the deep commitment to democracy of the late Ion Ratiu through his contribution as a Romanian politician as well as his interest in democratic change worldwide. Uh, I'm pleased to be the first one in the center to introduce to you the seventh recipient of the annual Ion Ratiu Democracy Award, Nabil Rajab. He's the president of the Bahrain <coughs> Center for Human Rights and the director of the newly established Gulf Center for Human Rights. Um, Nabil is going to give his main speech at 4 o'clock. Uh, we also have today with us Oleg Kozlovsky, who was last year's awardee, and he came from Moscow to participate in the event. And my special welcome and thanks to uh, Mr. Indrai and Nikolai Ratu, the son of the late Ian Ratu, who founded this. The workshop this afternoon is on youth, democracy change, and the Arab Spring. Um, we have three uh, distinguished panelists and two distinguished commentators. Um, Roy Gutman, who was the or is the Baghdad bureau chief for McClatchy newspapers, um, Robin Wright, the distinguished uh, scholar at the Woodrow Wilson. International Center for Scholar and the U United States Institute of Peace, and Carol Murphy, who is a public policy scholar at the Wilson Center. Uh, you have their uh, bios, so I'm not going to take your time in uh, introducing them. With that in mind, we'll start with Roy, followed by Robin. <coughs> and Carol, and then Nabil and Oleg will comment on the presentations. Thanks uh, so much, uh, and I appreciate <clears throat> you're putting me first in uh, the order of uh, speakers. Uh, my bag is packed here in the corner, but it, it turns out I'm not the only one. I, I'm heading back to Baghdad this afternoon, <clears throat> and uh, but I, when I heard about this conference and was invited to come, I thought, I, uh, and especially to as a tribute to Nabil, that um, I would uh, sooner arrive late at the airport than <clears throat> than, um, than miss this opportunity. Um, Nabil, uh, the uh, recipient of the Ratio Award, um, is a very special person. Uh, in the Bahrain context, and and really, uh, therefore, in the in the context of the broader Middle East, as it's going through this tremendous upheaval now, uh, known as the Arab Spring, um, I uh, myself was a late comer to the story. Uh, Carol Murphy uh, here uh, down on the uh, on the dais was uh, there earlier and did some uh, really terrific uh, uh, work. But on the whole, the reporters uh, have been absent, and the media and, and the American media has been, I think, negligent <clears throat> in reporting this. Uh, not simp not because we weren't interested, I think, but on the whole, uh, in the in the in the way we use our resources, um, the other stories were felt to be more important, or people just decided they didn't. It wasn't worth going there and staying. Um, and I arrived in late April. Uh, stayed uh, through uh, uh, the mid part of May, um, and 
uh, like many other reporters, did not have uh, a, a, a very good grounding on the history of Bahrain. So I really had to do everything the hard way. Uh, ordinarily, when we go to a foreign uh, country, uh, we organize ourselves as well as humanly possible by getting all the sources lined up, having your fixer, having your driver, having your interpreter, having um, uh, many, many contacts. <clears throat> but in Bahrain, at the time I went in, uh, this was really not possible. Uh, nobody wanted to drive for me. Nobody wanted to translate. <clears throat> nobody wanted to fix for me, uh, make appointments. Um, and uh, I was really on my own. Uh, luckily, I had Nabil's uh, na name, address, and phone number, and uh, and went to see him on the first day there. Uh, and I uh, asked him for advice, and he said, well, he was very busy. Please come back in the evening. And I got out of my hotel that evening after dinner and uh, got into a taxi cab and showed him the card and said, would you please take me to uh, Nabil's uh, residence? Uh, I didn't use his name. And so he started driving to Bani Jamra. In fact, we got all the way to the village. It's about, uh, I think, eight miles or so from, um, <clears throat> from central uh, uh, Manama. And um, uh, he said, w what was the address again? And, and I showed him the card. And he looked at the name. And he said, I'm not taking you there. I will have nothing to do with this man. If I, if I take my taxi into his neighborhood, <clears throat> uh, I, I will lose my taxi. I will lose my car. I could be arrested. And so there on the main highway, uh, about a mile from his house, I was unceremoniously dumped as a journalist. And this, this is something that in all of my many experiences, I hadn't had this happen before. Um, and, I, uh, uh, and he wanted to be paid, by the way, uh, for the fare, <laughs> one-way fare. Uh, so uh, I called up Nabil, and Nabil just said with total aplomb, he said, oh, don't worry, I'll come and pick you up. And he did, and in fact, he drove me back to my hotel that night, uh, sparing me about an eight-mile walk and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the the humiliation of uh, having lost my appointment. Uh, and uh, but the, the thing about Nabil, and and I think this is where the uh, the uh, judges really have made a, the right decision, <clears throat> is that uh, he's a man who collects facts who is extremely diligent, who seems to work, um, if not, I did wake him up the other night, uh, and I apologize uh, for a comment, but on the whole, he, does, he seems to go without sleep, and, and, um, and his facts check out. And for a journalist coming into a scene uh, uh, that's as, as uh, complex and as, uh, uh, as really tricky as Bahrain's, this is just invaluable. Um, and he's managed uh, through his many, many contacts in the media and way beyond, I think, to keep the Bahrain story alive. He's been maybe the, the single most uh, person responsible uh, for, for doing that. And there are many heroic people in Bahrain. I want to make, uh, please uh, don't, don't mistake <clears throat> this for saying uh, he's the only guy. No, there's some terrific people there <clears throat> who, are, who are honest, reliable, uh, really uh, stalwart uh, people who, who want a democratic outcome but have managed to spend a lot of time in jail. And the re real mystery you have to ask um, uh, Nabil about later, if he doesn't mention it in his remarks, is how have you stayed out of jail? <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, what I wanted to say is in the, in the short time I was there for a couple of weeks, I, I did see the youth of, uh, of uh, Citra and other villages uh, in revolt. Uh, I, it was very furtive. It was, it was very sneaky. It was at the middle of uh, late at night. <clears throat> they would come out in a group in a, a, dark, uh, in a dark street and they would, um, and they would chant. Uh, something, we want democracy, or down with the king, or whatever they were chanting. And uh, a, a few blocks away, the police would be uh, gathering uh, their uh, cruisers and their man manpower and their um, tear gas and their buckshot uh, uh, weapons. And they uh, were playing a cat and mouse game. And it went on every night that I was there. And I, uh, I, I tell you, they, the, the uh, the courage they're showing is, uh, is, is, is equal to that of any other country in the Arab Spring. <clears throat> they are not going to be uh, basically suppressed, and, uh, and they don't respect a, a government which is attempting to suppress free speech. Um, but uh, these young people in Bahrain, it seems to me, have done something uh, that, um, that um, e even the others in, in many other countries have not done. Uh, the others who are in revolt, and that is they have stirred up a geo 
political hornet's nest. Uh, the the uh, and I think again Carol, who's lived in Saudi can about for several years, uh, can uh, g give better depth about this. But the the fact is, uh, Saudi Arabia treats Bahrain, with which it's it's connected by a causeway, as almost like a propriet proprietary um, entity, uh, where the, the Saudis uh, have the the uh, basic uh, uh, weight. Uh, they are su supporting the economy in a very major way, uh, and they are providing security, uh, mostly out of view, uh, but uh, since the time that they sent their forces in uh, with other Gulf Cooperation Council uh, countries. But they were the leading figure, the leading power, and they, uh, and they still are. And the, I, I just came back from uh, uh, Riyadh uh, and was talking to everybody I, I could reach in and out of government about what the Saudis intend for Bahrain and why they are so um, hung up on Bahrain. I mean, it is an independent country. It is a sovereign state. It does uh, have its own uh, history and so on. And, um, uh, you know, what's, what's it to them? Well, <laughs> it's, a, it's an awful lot to them. Um, th and f frankly, uh, th it is often cast by the Saudis as a as a case that uh, of of the competition with Iran, uh, and that uh, they, what they fear is a zero sum game. That if uh, Bahrain should develop a democratic system, that is to say. <coughs> uh, maybe turning into a constitutional monarchy. The Khalifa family who, have, who rule the country have been there for more than two centuries. So there's, this is a long-standing uh, uh, monarchy. But if it were to turn into that, that, um, uh, that the biggest gainer would be Iran. <clears throat> and this is because, as you all know, I, I expect, uh, the majority population in Bahrain is uh, Shia. Uh, and uh, uh, as is, of course, uh, Iran, uh, and whereas uh, Saudi and the Khalifas who run uh, Bahrain are uh, Sunni. So in a sense, there's a, there's a sectarian issue from the Saudi uh, perspective, um, and they do not want to see uh, Shia uh, running uh, Bahrain. Um, and I was told by somebody who may or may not know, uh, uh, you know, what really is in the king's mind, that uh, were it to happen that uh, the uh, Bar Bahrainis got a constitutional monarchy where actually the majority uh, ruled and, uh, and, but still respected the king, that um, the moment they, that the Saudis saw somebody, it could be anybody in a, in a faraway village, uh, carrying a banner showing uh, support for Iran, like a picture of Khamenei, or uh, the Supreme Leader, um, that the Saudis would be sending in forces immediately, that this would be war, they would be in there. Now, uh, it's, it's quite, a, uh, quite a threat, uh, because God knows nobody can control every person in, in the country, no, even if it's a, uh, a totally legitimate uh, uh, uprising and they, and they have real genuine grievances. Um, so uh, this is a uh, this is a very serious uh, threat. Now I, I happen to think that this may be just a cover story. That this may be one uh, important element for the Saudis being so uh, concerned, and uh, that the more important thing for them is is really just the the nature of the uh, regime at this ta time and the speed at which it reforms. Uh, because I think if you talk to uh, some of the uh, intelligent uh, Saudi uh, officials, and there really are many of them, uh, they will all concede that uh, that Bahrain does need a change of of uh, leadership in the political sphere, <clears throat> that the uh, prime minister, uh, the uncle of the king, really uh, has his time, his sell-by time has, has uh, come and gone, and that uh, uh, Bahrain uh, uh, has got to find its way to a better system. Uh, what they fear, I, I think, the most is the speed at which this happens, uh, because uh, if Bahrain were to change uh, uh, its political system in the near term, Kuwait would be next. And then after Kuwait, the Emirates. And God knows after the Emirates, maybe even Saudi itself. And so uh, there's, a, uh, there's a kind of a geopolitical dominoes uh, game that they are seeing. Uh, uh, the second thing just to mention is that the, the rivalry with Iran is a very serious one. And it's one which I don't think is always uh, discussed in rational terms uh, by uh, even the experts uh, that one would find in, in Saudi. 
Uh, and it and uh, but it's, it's it's a real thing, and the Arab Spring has exacerbated it. Uh, Bahrain is one example, and the other one, which is not on uh, the discussion today, is Syria. Uh, the Saudis in Syria w would like to see the overthrow of a, a minority government, which would mean the bringing in the, the Sunnis, which is the exact almost the mirror opposite of what's uh, the situation in Bahrain. <clears throat> where uh, the Iranians would, ha and they ha the Iranians have given propaganda support, certainly, but I don't know if there's any any material support um, to the Bahraini Shia who would like to see a majority rule there. Now, um, Saudi itself, and I, I'll just finish with this observation, is not immune to um, to the Arab Spring, and no, uh, I think no Saudi official will say they are. Um, uh, but you don't see many signs of it there. <laughs> in fact, you see next to, uh, you, you, just, you just wonder, this is like, like another planet in some ways. But uh, where, where you can see the first, some of the first stirrings uh, of, of genuine dissent uh, that I think is, is probably really getting uh, very much to the royal family and to the, uh, and to the, uh, the, the leaders of uh, Saudi uh, is, uh, of all places, on YouTube. It's the social media, once again. Um, and there's a terrific film which I can recommend to you, and it's got, a, it's got English subtitles uh, that you can pick up on YouTube pretty quickly called uh, Monopoly. Uh, and um, I, it's worth seeing uh, uh, many times, more than once. Maybe you've seen it, Robin. Um, anyway, it's, um, uh, it's about uh, the housing shortage, uh, something that many of us just never f heard, heard much about and, uh, and, and certainly hadn't been documented that much. Um, in the Western media. Um, and uh, it opens up, uh, and a, a, the scene is on the Persian Gulf where a young Saudi rolls out of his uh, Chevy van <coughs> in white pajamas and he praises God for his good fortune. There's a Quranic verse that is chanted uh, as he performs his morning ablutions in the sea prior to the morning prayer. And it all comes across, uh, frankly, as ironic. Um, <coughs> uh, here's the quote from the, the, uh, the citation from the Quran. <clears throat> Thy guardian Lord hath not forsaken thee, nor is he displeased. Did he not find thee an orphan and give thee shelter? And he found thee wandering and gave thee guidance, and he found thee in need and made thee independent. And so the film is all about how this, uh, this uh, young uh, Saudi uh, uh, lives in this van and how he's going to offer his van uh, to other homeless uh, young Saudis. Uh, and, it's, and it's full of Quranic vi verses, which I think on the whole are used uh, ir ironically. Um, uh, and, it's a, and it's a powerful weapon. I think in the first three or four weeks, a million people downloaded Monopoly. And I think it's still, it's still going. Uh, other films have come out uh, on YouTube, and some of their, uh, some of their producers have landed uh, straight in jail. Uh, so you can see that the people are taking note. Um, so how does this impact on Bahrain, and how does Bahrain impact on Saudi? Um, I don't know. I would just say one thing, and, and uh, Nabil is, again, the person who, uh, who is, is the most important uh, one here at the table. Uh, watch this space. Bahrain is not over. The, uh, the, the grievances have not been addressed, <clears throat> the, uh, despite the promises of the king. Uh, the report uh, of uh, 10 days ago uh, by uh, Sharif Basayuni uh, uh, certainly listed most of the uh, abuses uh, but didn't necessarily draw conclusions, which of course was not its mandate. Um, but if you look at that as a factual record and if you listen to, uh, Bar to uh, Nabil's uh, uh, very factual accounts, then you'll see uh, Bahrain is still there, and Bahrain, uh, because of these geopolitical reasons I've just given you, I think is a, a vital place to watch. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Robbie. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Holly for including me. I'm delighted to be here uh, to honor someone who's done such important work. Um, I wanted to step back a little bit and look at the broader phenomena. What is it that has led to the uh, uh, emergence of youth as the critical factor in changing the face of a part of the world that has lived under autocratic rule for not just um, uh, centuries but millennia? And I think there are four factors that I want to identify. And one is the very basic issue of numbers. Uh, you have demographics in which two-thirds of the population of the 300 million population in the Middle East is under the age of 30. And this is proportionately the largest baby boom in the world. 
And for someone who emerged as a product of the baby boom in the United States, I know how it can change a society. And so we can't underestimate the numbers game to begin with. Uh, the second factor is one that isn't often uh, credited enough, and that's literacy. For the first time in the Middle East, you have the majority of people who are literate. They may not have college degrees or high school degrees, but they are literate. And they can see this offers them context beyond their immediate village, their immediate environment, their immediate home. Uh, it helps build aspirations. It helps build a sense of um, whether it's the nation, the region, or the world. And I think this has been critically important because many of the people, the young people in the region, see them see their lifetimes having played out at a time that there's been extraordinary change elsewhere in the world, whether it's the demise of communism in um, Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, the collapse of apartheid and minority rule in Africa, uh, the end of military dictatorships in Latin America, that their context is change that has happened everywhere else, and they see that you know, um, as their lives as part and parcel of the same phenomena. And I think the thing that's so interesting about this literacy is that it is, it is just as common among females. And even in the two most repressive Muslim societies in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia and Iran, you have the majority of university students today who are female, and that's a first. Uh, the majority of students in, in Iran, anyway, doing science and engineering are female. These are not, I'm sure we would not have figures anywhere close that high in the United States or probably in Western Europe. So that's the second factor. Um, uh, the third factor is, uh, as Roy alluded, the, the social media. And I want to move beyond just access to YouTube and Facebook and so forth, to the fact that most of the young grew up in what I call the Al Jazeera era. And the important part about this is that since 1996, when Al Jazeera became the first independent television channel in the Middle East, circumventing state control of all other forms of the media, there has been an explosion of television stations. There are now over 500 independent satellite television stations in the Middle East that broadcast, you know, in some cases, in small areas, some cases, in most cases, uh, across the region. And what that's important for is not just the fact that they circumvent state control, but that they introduce the idea of diversity, that you have not just one accounting of what happened today or one type of music or one uh, many of these programs are religious, not just one interpretation of a Quranic verse, but a huge diversity. I mean, the number of clerics who are on television, or pseudo-clerics, what I call the YouTube imams and the satellite sheikhs, uh, who are not trained in theology or religious scholarship, but they get on, um, they have their very own, very popular shows on television, Amr Khalid, uh, who's an Egyptian, uh, uh, then you have um, uh, Ahmed al-Shugari uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, and then you have someone conservative like uh, uh, Kardawi. Uh, that there is this full range of ideas that is out there. And the mere fact that people are growing up in an environment where they see diversity is very different from their parents' generation, where it was state-controlled, one, one version of events, one uh, ideology, um, one truth. And for a religion where the observant have believed that there was one path to God, the whole idea of introducing diversity, different interpretations, is really tremendously important. The fourth reason is the reaction to extremism. That particularly since 2003, we've seen a number of attacks in many of these countries that ended up killing their own. And Iraq is one of the prime examples. There was recently a survey, uh, maybe six or seven weeks ago, released that showed that the United States had lost 200 um, deaths, had suffered 200 deaths, two suicide bombs in Iraq. Iraqis, since 2003, 
had lost 12,000 killed and over 30,000 injured. The price that they are paying, not just in lives, but in economic loss, political uncertainty, unemployment, um, you know, even things like basic electricity and so forth, that the, the consequences of this unstable environment has taken a real toll. And that, in turn, relates to their ability to look at a future, develop a future, whether it is finding a home, uh, having access to employment, having enough money to pay for, for uh, to get married. And that is a big issue, that this has affected virtually all aspects of life. And so all of this comes together, I think, in a, a very profound way and has produced a generation that is disproportionately powerful, um, unfortunately not well equipped, not experienced, without the resources to deal with creating an alternative. But they know what they don't want. They know there is diversity, that there is something else available to them. And so they, are, they have taken you know, all kinds of imaginative steps. And the mere fact that you've seen in diverse societies the young taking the lead, whether they are in living in military dictatorships, uh, monarchies, socialist regimes, whether they are rich, whether they are dirt poor like Yemen, whether they are deeply tribal or homogenous, that in every society you've seen the same kind of um, expression, the same uh, turning to, uh, p initially anyway, peaceful civil disobedience. Um, and the thing that's important about this is not just the politics of change, the kinds of things that we see play out on the streets of Cairo or Sidi Bou Said and, uh, uh, in, in uh, Tunisia or in Homs and uh, Hama in, in Syria. It's also important in, in what I call the culture of change. Because when we look at how deep does this trend go among the young, how long can it last, um, what are its roots, it is often the culture of change that has been what initially got them into, uh, helped att attach them to a movement, to, a, to an idea. Uh, and this plays out in a place like Tunisia, where we saw um, uh, Mohamed Bouazizi become the first in his act of self-emulation last December 17th, trigger this uh, explosion of um, dissent. But it was, but he carried out his act in an environment where you had seen young rappers who had begun to challenge the regimes, who had put songs that were far more critical, openly critical, of uh, President Ben Ali than any politician in his 23-year rule had ever been. So, talking about in song, and, and in verse, how people were living off garbage, that uh, the police were interested only in privilege and profit rather than the practice of law and order. Uh, and, and that happened several weeks before um, Bouazizi set himself on fire. And it was fascinating to watch how this song placed on Facebook, where and 20 percent of Tunisians are on Facebook, how it spread, and that immediately afterward, as uh, people were demonstrating, moving from town to village uh, up through Tunis, that people sang the hip-hop song of the young rapper in their protests. And then it was sung in Egypt and later apparently in Bahrain as well. That, uh, that it is the culture of change that has brought a lot of the young, uh, partly with, uh, through help of uh, the social media, into politics, help them define what they want, help them express their rage, help them co to connect with each other in societies where you can't openly join a group or join a civil society movement that is calling for change, that they attach themselves to each other through culture. Um, one of my other favorite uh, means of looking at the, uh, the kind of culture of change is, is that the new Muslim comedians, the young who have introduced uh, the ideas of ridicule, of questioning in their comedic skits. And they do this both of the autocrats and of the extremists. I have a, I should have brought my book, but I have a wonderful joke uh, that, that a young Iranian-born uh, comic tells against the, uh, the bomber of the, uh, the guy who tried, tried to blow up the flight from uh, Amsterdam to Detroit. And uh, 
but the whole idea that you use comedy as a tool to introduce questioning, uh, not just to to kind of make the cultural bond that we're just like you and uh, everywhere else in the world, we've got problems with our mother-in-laws as well, but to make that link between we want um, political change. And I think this is uh, particularly uh, something that's quite common among uh, the young women, again, where you have a culture of change, where they have found ways to integrate themselves in society, define the movements. One of my favorite stories is about a young Egyptian uh, a woman who is a, a blogger, um, an activist who got involved in um, human rights issues because at the age of eight she went through a female genital circumcision or mutilation. And she was so angry about this that she argued within her family to stop this from happening to her, uh, her sister and cousins. And she ended up, uh, as a young adult, engaged loving movies. She loved chick flicks. She loved, she even admitted she liked Arnold Schwarzenegger um, action movies. Uh, that that uh, she began uh, the first Arab Human Rights Fe Film Festival um, and, and in the process helped generate a new generation of young filmmakers who made films about human rights issues. That there are lots of ways and that when we look at this moment, and for those of you who haven't seen the news today, the announcement out of Cairo is that the Muslim Brotherhood has probably over 40 percent, and the Salafis may have won as much as 25 percent, giving them up to 65 percent of, and again, remember, this is just one third of the, the voting, but that they may actually have not just a plurality, but a majority. That when we look at these issues and the kind of scope of change, we have to kind of step back and look at what is it, who are they, what is it they want, and this is where the aspirations of the young are so critical, and they will be the ones with their numbers to hold these governments to account. They know how they have power. They can take, they can go to the streets, but they can use these other tools as well to um, say, you're not providing the jobs. You're not addressing issues of um, personal security, crime, uh, corruption, and to hold the Islamist uh, movements to account. And they know how to do it. Um, my young blogger, uh, Egyptian friend, uh, you know, I asked her if she was afraid of what was going to come next, and she actually turned out to she's she ran for um, parliament, and Tahrir Square is in her constituency, uh, and she's even though she's a hijab wearing 29 uh, year old now, she uh, doesn't like the Muslim Brotherhood, and um, she said, you know, I'm I'm. I'm concerned about the future because I don't think we have the resources to build a, a, a democracy, the knowledge to do it. You know, we've got a long way to go. But she said, am I afraid? She said, no, because I know I now have power and I know how to use it. So Thank I'll leave you. it there. Thank you, Robin. Uh, I, I asked the same blogger, I think, Dalia, um, what would happen if uh, there is going to be a president which is not to their liking, and she looked at me, and she said, well, we have tahrir, so meaning that we'll all go back there. So this is the way they look at things. Good afternoon. Um, I'm happy to be here and also be part of this um, honor ceremony for Nabil, who also was a great help to me as a reporter when I was based in Riyadh and uh, covering Bahrain by telephone before I did actually go there. Um, I have to say one thing about what Roy said about the press ignoring Bahrain. Uh, to a certain extent it's true, but also there's a big problem that the government is not letting journalists come in freely. Um, I would like to just start my comments by uh, adding a bit to what Robin said about the youthfulness of this region. In the United States, people who are 14 years or younger make up 20% of our population. In Saudi Arabia, they make up 37%. Uh, people 29 and down in the United States make up 41% of our population. In Saudi Arabia, it's 66%. So you can see this huge youth bulge that has not even crested yet. It's not predicted to crest maybe till 2020. I'm talking about Saudi Arabia. And youth unemployment around the Middle East, 
uh, is at least 25 percent in most countries and probably higher. Among uh, 18 to 24-year-olds in Saudi Arabia, it's estimated to be around 39 to 40 percent. So this is a problem for all Arab countries, all Arab governments. And it was also a reason that helped lead to the Arab Spring. After all, the guy who started it all in Tunisia was trying to do his job, and he had a very lowly job, and he was being hounded or harassed by uh, a policewoman. Um, but it was not only unemployment. It was the lack of freedom. It was the lack of dignity. And it was a revolt, really, against the security services, more than the military people in the Middle East. Um, and this is what is, so, to me, so important to re keep remembering about the Arab Spring, that this was a breaking of a barrier of fear against the security services in most of these countries. Even in a place like Syria, probably the worst of worst human rights violators after Saddam Hussein, you can see what's happening there. People have lost their fear of revolt. So the obvious question is, well, why isn't it happening in Saudi Arabia? Uh, what happened to the youth there? Well, there are many explanations, and I'm going to go through a few right now. One is money. Saudi Arabia is a very wealthy country, and it uses a lot of its money on its citizens. It already is, for the past few years, it's been using 20, 26 of its, 26 percent of its annual budget has gone to education. And when the Arab Spring began breaking out last February, the government uh, announced several major financial packages, up to $130 billion, to uh, give benefits to its citizens. One was unemployment compensation for the first time. One was to build more affordable housing. One was to help young people get mortgages and various other things. The second reason there was not street protests in, in Saudi Arabia so far is uh, the repression. Um, this government is not as bad as Syria and Iraq or even Egypt. Uh, even human rights watchers admit or say that the Saudi government has stopped physical torture for the most part in the last few years. They use different methods. They use um, solitary confinement and not seeing your family and verbal abuse. But the level of physical torture uh, has never been as high as it is as, as it was in Iraq or is in Syria. Nevertheless, there is repression, and people who criticize the government in writing or speech do get regularly arrested. This is, it's selective, but it works. It, it puts fear in, in people. Um, on the day uh, that there was supposed to be a big street protest in Saudi Arabia last March, uh, so-called Day of Rage, supposedly organized uh, on Facebook by people who had Saudi Arabia's democratic interest at heart, but nobody knows who these people were. Um, there was a huge, huge police presence on the street. The Saudi government was taking no chances, um, so they had a huge police presence, and it worked. We journalists, there were about 40 journalists there riding around in a bus trying to find a protest. We found one protester. And uh, he promptly denounced Saudi Arabia as a police state to the cameras in front of all the journalists and in front of a lot of policemen. And he was promptly arrested. Not while we were there with our cameras, but he went home and they found him at home. And when I left in July, he was still in prison. 
So another reason that there's not been a protest is that the Saudis do things differently, and they have not had a culture of street protests. Um, there have been there were have been thousands of street protests in Egypt prior to Tahrir Square, regularly for years, um, and this is backed up by religious fatwas from the religious authorities of the state saying that protests are religiously haram or forbidden. It's, they're un-Islamic. Um, the way you should voice your criticism of the government is quietly in private. Now, I must say there are two caveats to what I've just said, uh, and that is that there have been small um, protests occasionally by workers who were protesting against not having a job or not getting a big enough salary. So what does that tell me? It tells me uh, exactly what Robin was saying, that um, all this communications revolution is having an impact even on the Saudis. Um, and the other thing I might say is that while the religious fatwas of saying that protests are un-Islamic, still have pretty much a heft within the Saudi society, which is very, very conservative. Young people don't have the same deference to these religious authorities that their parents did have. The most popular religious cleric in Saudi Arabia has nothing to do with the government. He is a government critic, although a very soft-spoken one. Um, and he is somebody who praised the protesters in Egypt. Now, uh, Saudi youth, because, just because they didn't go into the streets, um, doesn't mean they're not affected by what's been going on. When Tahrir S Square was at its peak last February, they were staying up all night uh, reading the tweets on Twitter, watching Al Jazeera television, just like me. And they were saying to me, you know, Egypt is like our sister state. They really, Egypt, Saudis have a, a deep, a good relationship with, with, with Egyptians. And they were basically telling me um, what happens in Cairo doesn't stay in Cairo. In other words, they were hoping and expecting there to be repercussions. But what the Saudi, even the young people, don't want is they don't want chaos in the streets. They look at um, Iraq, they look at Syria, even Tahrir. They don't want that in the kingdom. What they want is the government to voluntarily begin a process of political reform, giving them more political participation. They don't want to get rid of the monarchy because they see that as endangering the Saudi state. What they do want is political par participation and elected parliament and cabinet ministers whose average age is not 60 like it is now, but 40. Um, so this things are very much changing in Saudi, but it's changing very slowly. And the people who are bringing change are young people. And right now there are 20, 120,000 Saudis studying abroad. 47,000 of them are studying in the United States. They're beginning to come back to Saudi Arabia. And what do they want? They want a job. And the jobs right now are not there for them. So the government is getting a little bit panicky about this. And they're starting some programs to, to they know they have a problem. That's the first step. So they are beginning to change. Uh, the Arab Spring has really shifted the center of political gravity towards young people in the Middle East. And this is definitely going to have a spillover effect in the Gulf. So I'll stop there now, and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions later. Thank you. Nabil and then Oleg comment on what you
Well, uh, it's comment. It's not uh, as I'm going to speak later. Uh, Roy was uh, saying uh, the fears of Saudis uh, that democracy in Bahrain it could uh, threaten the Saudi Arabia, which is, I think, uh, true, because we cannot guarantee tomorrow if democracy come to Bahrain that will not have an influence on Saudi. And Saudis are uh, all other nations that they deserve to have uh, democracy. They deserve to live in justice where they are not now. Uh, human rights violation is uh, considered to be one of the most uh, country that violates human rights. Till today, there is a country in, in this world uh, where women cannot drive a car. That is Saudi Arabia. Uh, Carol is saying that people don't want to change the regime. But the same thing in Egypt. People didn't want to change the regime. In Tunisia, people didn't want to change the regime. But, the, but then the government forced them to say that we want to change the regime. With the oppression, with the excessive use of force, with killing people. In Bahrain, when people fought uh, in the beginning, they didn't want to change the regime because they want their freedom. They want to, to live in justice. But the government start killing people in the street, putting people for being active in Twitter, uh, b b uh, raiding houses, demolishing mosques. So always regime did not take experience from other countries. We've seen how it's been falling from started Tunisia, then Egypt, then again Syria, Bahrain, and Yemen, repeating the same mistake. Today they don't uh, want to remove the regime, but we cannot guarantee that. I think we as a movement, as a Democrats, as youth, as I'm seeing you, the future of, uh, the, the, you are the future here. We should support each other. We should support all democratic movement around the world. People in my country, in Bahrain, in Saudi Arabia, and all the Arab country needs your help. Needs your help. Democracy is for the interest of the whole world. Dictatorship is for no uh, interest of no one. So we should encourage youth movement in those countries. Youth are the leading today. The difference between Eastern Europe and uh, today, Eastern Europe uh, revolution, is that today is uh, the, not the elite uh, uh, heading uh, the revolution, but the youth movement are the leaders of the, of the revolution. So that's why I think we as Democrats, and uh, we need to support them. Uh, you know, Saudi and Bahrain, according to all indication, Freedom House, Reporter Without Borders, uh, named them all human rights organization, consider to be one of the worst uh, countries. I'm um, going to give you an example of Bahrain. Bahrain used to be categorized 67 out of 170 countries in, in 2002. Today, 143. Imagine dropped from 67 to 143. Uh, the, I mean, the thing that which was noticeable, the role of uh, social media. And this is where it brought the youth movement, youth people, from people listening always to the elite, to the leadership. Now, uh, frankly saying, I'm not exaggerating, people who are ruling, to, who are leading the revolution in the region are the youth movement. The elite suddenly realized themselves they are out of the picture because of the social media. The social media where the young people are more influential, people from 15 or 10 years old to 30 years old. Those people mostly in the social media, not people above maybe 55 or 60. So the elite suddenly, they thought, they've realized their size, and they've seen a new movement coming. It's not a religious movement. It's not a sectarian movement. It's not a racist movement. It's, based, it's, not, it's not based on the religious or political background. We've seen people in the street in Tunisia We've seen people in the street in, 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 in Egypt, and then we see people in the street. They are from all political background, from all, some of them without political background. I myself, from no political background, I just suddenly realized myself on the street with everybody fighting, with everybody for human rights. I mean, I was not even, uh, I didn't know how to use Twitter two years ago. Today I have 78,000 followers in Twitter. And I, I, I just say, I mean, Twitter and Facebook, I have almost 130, 140,000 followers. This is quarter of Bahrain population. <laughs> that shows you the influence of, uh, the, influence of uh, the, 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 the social media. Today, uh, it's this media that can't be controlled by government. It's not a newspaper that can shut down. 
Yes, uh, Egyptian people, they've shut down the, uh, the internet to solve that for a few days. Yes, the Tunisian, uh, they shut down the website, if Twitter and Facebook. Yes, Bahrain, they didn't do this or that, but they arrested people who are activists. Hundreds of people in Bahrain were arrested and tortured because of the, their being active in Twitter and Facebook. Some of them were tortured to death as well. But still, this remains the most influential. I'm asking you, I'm urging you to help your colleagues in those countries who are fighting for democracy, who are fighting for justice. We should help each other. You should be more involved. We should put your hand along with them to help those newly born democracies in our region. Thank you. Thank you, um, Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to uh, comment on uh, what Robin Wright said uh, about the reasons uh, why the youth uh, are more active now than they used to be uh, in the region. And uh, I, I would like to make a more generic uh, comment uh, on why the youth are so often the, uh, the engine, the vehicle of the uh, revolution. Uh, so I, I think it's quite obvious that we all uh, believe that the youth are usually more idealistic and uh, less willing to compromise, more impatient, if you will. Uh, and they also often have fewer obligations. They literally have uh, little uh, uh, to lose. Uh, they may not have families. Uh, they may not have uh, property or financial obligations. Uh, they have, have more spare time, uh, especially if they don't have a job. Uh, and this this time uh, is also a very important resource uh, uh, if you if you're talking about political or civil activism uh, and they often want to and are very impatient to get ahead to uh, improve their lives uh, and it it may become revolutionary if they see that all social lifts uh, are blocked uh, and uh, after all, they, uh, they, most of them now uh, know how to use Twitter and Facebook, uh, and it, it, it's become uh, the most, one of the most important factors uh, in the recent years. But uh, there, is, there are also other cases, and uh, I may use the case that is the most familiar to me, uh, my country, Russia, uh, where the youth are in general uh, much more conservative, or a bit more conservative at least, uh, than the general population, uh, contrary to the to these common beliefs. While there are many uh, young people who want uh, to have change, there are even more uh, who uh, are quite conforming, uh, who support the regime according to the uh, opinion polls, uh, less likely to protest. Uh, they often say that politics is dirty, so this is, sometimes this is their expression of idealism by not participating uh, in politics, uh, which may or may not be the case uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia or some other, uh, other countries of the Middle East. Uh, they have fewer horizontal networks. Uh, they often believe that uh, they really depend on the older generation and on the establishment. And therefore, uh, if they want to be successful, uh, they have to cooperate with the regime. They have to be, uh, to support uh, the status quo. Otherwise, they will be kicked out. Uh, and this is a very, very thin, uh, a, a very thin uh, border with, with the situation when they feel that all is blocked, the, all, all the ways uh, to get ahead are blocked and they have to change the system. Now they feel that they, they can cooperate. If they feel that it's become too difficult, they will withdraw their cooperation. Uh, and sometimes it's also about culture. Uh, and w when, uh, when the culture in the society in general uh, values uh, money or career higher than dignity, uh, then the youth are very rece uh, receptive uh, to this, uh, to, to this uh, cultural, uh, these are cultural v values, and uh, they are not going to uh, compromise their success uh, in, ca in their careers, for instance, 
uh, for uh, fighting uh, for dignity. Uh, however, all of these things are temporary, and I think that probably in, uh, in Saudi Arabia and most probably in my country, uh, this is going to change and the youth is going to become more politically active. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Oleg. We will open the floor um, to uh, uh, your questions and uh, if you have any comment. Uh, Robin, let me ask you a question. In uh, 2009, after the Iranian presidential elections, we have had massive demonstrations. I mean, the figures vary from a million to two million, and a um, substantial number of the protesters were young people, and their use of social media, that's 209, was mostly cell phone to notify each other. And then, of course, we had then bloggers and so on. But there was less talk about Twitter and Facebook and so on. It didn't have any ripple effect across the region then, while in the Tunisia, right, this is a question to you, to the Nabil to Carol too. I mean, why didn't the Iranian protest movement, not only was it aborted in Iran, but why didn't it have a ripple effect then? And then vice versa, why doesn't what happened today in the region, why isn't it affecting Iran? Uh, well, a couple of things. First of all, I think the fact that the state in Iran could use force to put down the uprisings shows how inexperienced they all are. The same thing happened to a certain degree in uh, Bahrain. You use, you exert enough force, you put up enough manpower, you uh, use, you know, pull the plug on technology that you can force these movements down. That's what the Syrians are trying to do now, uh, not successfully. Uh, but I actually think there was a bit of a ripple effect because the people I went out to see in the run-up to what became the Arab Spring in Egypt and so forth, talked about, man, if they can do it in Iran, they, we ought to be able to do it here. And I think it did have an impact in their thinking that, wait a minute, you know, uh, that the kind of demonstrations, as Carol pointed out rightly, that there have been lots of demonstrations in the Middle East at different points. We went through the Cedar Revolution in Lebanon, the Damascus Spring, that there had been lots of protests in, in Egypt for various things that it never quite generated the momentum. Um, and it was interesting that after uh, Egypt, particularly, that some of my Iranian friends were telling me about they made another stab at trying to get something going again. And it was very short-lived, and again, the, the state superseded or b was able to put it down. But they came up with this very clever tactic that were like flash mobs. And they would go to a street corner or a park or whatever, and they'd have a group of them, and they'd take their videos, and they'd have two, li two rows of cars waiting for them. One to take them quickly after 15 minutes, because they knew it would take 15 minutes for the, the cops to get there. And they'd go to the next spot. And meanwhile, the second row of cars would hold back the security um, police. And they tried that. And that you know, didn't generate enough in terms of size or um, you know, attention. And so it, it didn't succeed as well. But I think this is where we tend Americans to be so so impatient. You know, we think of well, Hosni Mubarak can go in 18 days. Well, you know, you can get rid of the whole whole every dictator in a, in a mere six months, and it just doesn't happen like that. And that this is a long process, and that whether it's Syria or Yemen uh, or more recently Libya, that the that these longer examples um, are going to be more typical because after Egypt and after Tunisia. The all regimes were all put on notice. This is what could happen, and they all began taking precautions. And if it hadn't been for the NATO uh, in intervention in eroding the intelligence and military capabilities in Libya, Libya would have gone on for a lot longer, too. It would look much more like Yemen than, than, um, than Egypt. And so um, you're absolutely right in your question. It's a great question. It's one that people ask all the time, you know, why did Iran was Iran able to put it down and the Arabs weren't? I mean, there, again, you had the military that turned on the leaders because of their own sense of privilege. And in some cases, you could argue that, that uh, Tunisia and Egypt, for all the, the noble things the kids did at Tahrir Square, were 
in the at the end of the day, uh, the first phase was a military coup d'etat to protect their own privilege. And if they hadn't done that, the kids alone could not have done it. I think, uh, no, I think they were successful because the Iranian, the first people to use the social media in the region for protesting and coming out. And we learned, um, in fact, from the Iranian. But the difference is that they were fighting to for a candidate against one candidate. I mean, not it's different than what was going in the Arab region to change the whole regime. It was uh, about candidate whom they feel that the, the election was not clean. But I think we learned a lot from the protests in Iran and uh, there where they started the social media. Uh, yes, in the back. Can I ask you to uh, wait for the mic and identify Yourself. The mic is right behind you, I believe. Thank you. <clears throat> my name is Lou Mendelson. I'm an international consultant. Uh, my questions are probably for Carol and Robin. Uh, they, then they're related. Uh, one, the first one is about the education in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I was struck by your discussion of, of the education, but I wondered about the Wahhabi and the regime in Saudi Arabia turning uh, most of the education to the Wahhabi schools. And I'm, I may not understand what that means, but I, I thought it was a more religious uh, approach. And the second is, uh, looking at today's news, as Robin pointed out, uh, the uh, uh, supremacy uh, in Egypt of, of the uh, Islamist group and the majority that they've uh, raised in their first um, election. Uh, is there a connection between the education, whether in Saudi Arabia or other countries, and the democracy, which may lead to an Islamist majority rather than a more um, a secular majority? Uh, and, and what are the expectations for the, for the direction uh, based upon the education and, and, and the trends that you see. Thank you. First of all, on education in Saudi Arabia, the education system has been abysmal. Uh, it only began to change when uh, King Abdullah came in in 2005 as king. And he uh, initiated serious changes in, in the curriculum and in the training of teachers, uh, even before, even up to now, a predominantly large proportion of a classroom is devoted to religious subjects and to Arabic. And this is the uh, religion, religious subjects influenced by the Wahhabi version of Islam, which is the dominant one in Saudi Arabia, which, as you all know, is very, very conservative. Um, the, the changes that they've begun in the last two or three years are beginning um, in some religion books in the first, second, and third grades. Uh, the math and science, they've got new textbooks, new curriculum. They're giving more emphasis to math and science. Uh, there have been uh, five or six or seven new universities created, some of them private, but obviously they still have to follow government regulations. So a sincere and serious process of educational reform has begun. The question is, will it be fast enough? And I have my doubts about that. Um, so uh, and if you meet kids 18 years and older, they will express deep frustration with their education because they'll tell you, I wasn't trained to do anything. I can't do a job. I didn't learn anything. Um, they didn't learn a work ethic. They didn't learn how to be in business. And they are frustrated, both men and women. Now, the, the second part of your question, uh, you know, Egypt had a very secular education system, but you know, they just elected Islamists uh, to, to their parliament in a, in a plurality, if not a majority. Uh, the popularity of the Islamists in, today in Morocco, Tunisia, and Egypt, they've already, they've won elections in three of them. The popularity of Islamists 
doesn't really stem from the type of education system. It stems from the fact that people are really tired of a system and a society that was copied from France or the United States uh, or Britain. And they've all failed. Uh, you know, <laughs> socialism, capitalism, pan-Arab nationalism, blah, 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 they've all failed. So let's try something indigenous. Let's try something that comes from our soil, our hearts, our religion. And this is what's happening today. And this is why what is happening is so very exciting. It's an age of experimentation. And it's my firm belief that no long-term societal change in the Middle East is going to succeed unless it's expressed in Islamic idiom. And that's what's happening now. This is why people are attracted to the Muslim Brotherhood, because they talk the language of Islam. Now, so does the government in Turkey. And they're not radicals. Uh, in fact, Arabs, I think, today look to Turkey far more than they look to Iran as a model for them to create an Islamic society and Islamic government. Uh, just one more thing that's interesting. The party created by the Muslim Brotherhood, which just won big in Egypt, their political platform doesn't call for an Islamic state. It calls for a civil state. Because these guys are smart enough to know if they start talking Islam too much, they're going to lose support and just create antagonism to them. They want to follow the model, I think, of Turkey, which has been successful in amalgamating a more Islamic society with democratic ideals. Uh, uh, that's up. Nothing. Uh, Oleg, you, you feel like talking about secularism and religion? No. Nadir, yalla. You don't want to add something like the role of religion in the future. But again, I, I mean, I'm afraid they always I keep repeating things because I speak in the other session and here. Uh, since uh, I mean, w there are worries about uh, the s school in Saudi Arabia, and I think uh, most of the extremism come from that part of the world, from that part of uh, education. And uh, I'm worried also that they send uh, a lot of uh, people uh, with the same belief to Egypt to interrupt and to the, the damage the what we expect to be a newly born democracy, as they've done with Iraq in the past few years. But thanks God, it did not succeed. But from the other side, I said, if you can't say Islamist as it is one group. Islamists are many groups now. There are people, Islamists, you haven't. Saudi Arabia, then you have Islamists in Iran, then you have Islamists in Turkey. Which Islamists are you talking about? I, th I think uh, they have the right to be in politics. They have the right to express their uh, political opinion. They have the right uh, to engage in the whole political process. And they have to respect the political process. They have to respect the democracy. Uh, and we should give them a chance, as we give everybody. Today, we have a successful model that uh, in Turkey, where people in the West have a good relation with the West and has a, have good relation with the Islamic uh, countries. So, uh, so it's not a bad model, which has been accepted. So what I'm saying, there are fears, I've realized, ex exaggerated fears of Islamist, Islamist, Islamist. First of all, Egypt is we're talking two days old, يعني, two days old uh, election. Wait, uh, the wait, I mean, Iraqi first election, second election, a lot of problems, second one will be, get better, the third one, you know, it takes time, process, people need to learn that. Don't get in hurry, thank you. Uh, yes, in the front, please. Just, yes, uh, wait, and then in the back. Just wait. Okay. But identify yourself, thank you. Hi there, uh, my name's David, I'm unemployed. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so one of the interesting features about the Gulf region is that there's such a huge population of foreign workers. And I don't know the case about Bahrain or Saudi, but uh, Qatar, um, I think there's the, maybe a quarter, fewer than a, or less than a quarter of the population is, uh, is Qatari. In the UAE, you can walk around Dubai for the evening and not see an Arab person. So has the foreign population played any role in the democracy movement in the Gulf? Thank you. <laughs> 
Well, we don't expect uh, foreign uh, workers coming from uh, Southeast Asia poor to be engaged in political uh, arena, which is very dangerous for them. Being part of the unionist movement and all that, that could be dangerous. I have seen uh, last year when they were engaged, some of them in a protest in the United Arab Emirates and in Kuwait, what that has happened, they were deported and sent back home. Uh, you know, it's easy, everything in the in the, ra- the r- hand of the ruler, they can do. I mean, give you an example of a friend of mine, he's from Pakistan, he born and lived all his life in Bahrain, and he's doing, looking after our work, our website in the center, which is blocked in my country. The, the government discovered that, and they sent him back home, and they blacklist him after 30 years living. So you don't expect this poor community to be engaged. Uh, Besides, uh, there are uh, well, there are a lot of human rights violations committed against this uh, uh, migrant workers in the Gulf. They don't have right to to gather. They don't have to right to be part of union. They don't have the right to be strike, and they've been treated badly. They've been giving very low salaries. So there are full. Um, we will. There are a big list of reports being issued by human rights organization. <laughs> including Human Rights Watch. And so they are marginalized in our, uh, in our society, as well as the local people marginalized from the rural, ruler. But we hope that they could have a, a political role in the future. They could have a, a, a role in the unionist movement, because the majority of them are men. They don't, uh, not women. Majority you know, of them, they come as a worker for two years, three years, four years. And then they go back home. So there is, they don't play any role so far. Uh, no role at all in Saudi. They're, they're just um, non-political. Sure. In the back, please. And the, yes. <coughs> My name is Peter Bombush. I'm a retired lawyer. Um, I uh, printed out the other day and pretty much ruined my printer the report of the Bahrain Independent Commission of Inquiry. <laughs> I think it's about 500 pages. Um, in the back, this is uh, for Nabil, please. Um, in the back, it talks about the negotiations that uh, went on between the Crown Prince and some of the uh, opposition groups. And it suggested that they failed, and had they succeeded, this would have changed things. I wondered if you could comment on those negotiations, because I really don't understand what went on and what the results were. Thanks. Well, it's a political question. It's difficult to ask a human rights activist, uh, but I will still, I will still uh, comment. Uh, people were protesting and uh, w- started 14th of February uh, youth movement calling for the same obligation, the same promises the king have given the people of Bahrain in 2001. But then he, he did not fulfill those promises. So on the same 10th anniversary, 14th of February, people were protesting. As you know, many people were killed. Uh, the king, uh, the crown of presence, it seems that he had negotiation with the opposition, which I'm not aware of the detail of it because they have not invited me. <laughs> but, but I know that uh, it, it failed and that the protests continue. And we have um, in a few months time, 47 people were killed. Thousands of people were wounded, and uh, many people were uh, systematically tortured. No less than 100 people lost their eyes because they shot them in their eyes. Men, women being raped, sexually harassed, mosques being demolished, houses being raided, and people, I mean, it's very bad. But let's hope things be better. Now let's take this, I mean, this is an opportunity the government could take, and the ruling elite could take this report as an opportunity to go forward. Yes, it's not perfect, but it's could be stick, taken as a step number one by the rulers to implement this, this recommendation, and we are watching them in the coming days on that. Thank you. Yes, here. Uh, yes, and just the mic is coming, please. Thank you. I'm uh, Benjamin, too. I'd like to return, uh, in a sense, to the question of foreign workers that the uh, young gentleman uh, just uh, raised in the context of the potential for reform. For example, in Saudi Arabia, which has a very high uh, percentage of foreign workers, these workers could gradually not be replaced and uh, jobs created for uh, Saudi youth, including for uh, young Saudi women who could drive around, the other women who don't drive, and so on. 
what is the, uh, I realize this cannot be done overnight because of, uh, uh, but uh, the fact is, is that Saudi young people are getting educated and so on, could qualify for many of these jobs. Could you discuss the extent to which uh, Saudi officials are studying this issue and the prospects for possible reform along those lines? Um, there are 21 million Saudis. There are 8 million foreign workers in Saudi. 90 percent of jobs in the private sector, 90 percent are held by foreigners. Um, it's a shocking statistic. I didn't believe it when I first saw it. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the government realizes it has a problem providing jobs. So uh, they are getting tougher on their process of Saudiization, which is the policy they've had that companies should hire Saudis, not foreigners. It's never been uh, enforced. I mean, and uh, everything the government did to try to enforce it, the, the, the businesses would get around it. Because what businessman wants to hire a Saudi who he'll have to pay 4,000 riyals a month to and who will only work 35 hours a week and leave when he has to drive his wife to the doctors because she can't drive? Instead of hiring a Pakistani who will uh, only cost him 1,000 riyals a month and will work weekends and overtime and never complain. Uh, so, you know, the business, the business community, wh who all have royal family partners, they don't want to change this. They like the foreign uh, workforce. But last spring, the government announced a new, a new effort at uh, Saudiization, and they raided every company, and they put these for the first time on the internet, so you can see which company in Saudi is obeying the um, quotas for Saudi uh, employees and which is not. We still don't know, we'll have time will tell, how strictly this is going to be enforced. Um, the other thing I read about, I don't know the details, is that Saudi are, are, are thinking of putting limits on the amount of money a foreign worker can return home. Uh, this will be a great disincentive if they if they actually do this uh, for foreign workers to come to Saudi. Uh, I don't really see how they're going to enforce that either. But there are tons of jobs that no Saudi, even if you give him ten thousand riyals a month, wants to do. So there'll always be a big foreign presence, and if they can. Um, get jobs for their young people by reducing uh, the 8 million to some more workable number, um, I think they'll be okay. But then they'll have to worry about, th there's still gross human rights abuses of these workers. They're not paid enough. They don't have adequate housing. Um, they can't bring their families. Uh, it's, it's just really bad situation. Yes, please, the mic. Can I have the mic? Yes, the lady in the. Thank you. Yes. Hi. We'll, we'll keep the mic here so the gentleman in the back. My name is Shahrazad Faramarzi, and I'm a reporter. Um, I was also going to go back to David's point, and if Nabil can elaborate on it, He's, he was asking about the role of foreigners in the democracy movement. I just was wondering if Nabil could tell us about the, uh, the anti-democratic movements, for example, foreigners, the naturalized um, policemen and the army that took part in the crackdown, and as well as um, average uh, naturalized Bahrainis from other countries, whether it was you know Iraq or Syria or Yemen or Sudan, they were actually taking anti-protest um, uh, protests taking place. I think that that's a very major part of the the um, problems that the Bahrainis have. Thank you. Should I? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, this is uh, another side of uh, migrant workers and how it's been exploited by the government. 
government of Bahrain does not uh, allow Shia citizens to be part of the army or the police. Shia are the majority of the indigenous population uh, in Bahrain. They are not allowed to work in the army and the police. So they bring army from outside, from Jordan, Syria, and Yemen, and Pakistan. And the same thing they have for the police. And most of the uh, people who uh, have committed the violation against the local and the killing in the past uh, 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 month, they were migrant uh, employed by our government. They bring them as mercenaries uh, from uh, tribes, uneducated people, and they use them in those uh, security, intelligence, army institution. And that is a problem because that makes a kind of hatred between the local people and those uh, groups. Because many of those people, local people, were tortured, they were killed by migrant workers that they were brought from these countries. And this is a very dangerous thing. And what happened is that as an awarding them, government of Bahrain, after a few years also, they give them Bahraini nationality because the majority of Bahrain are Shias. And the government, the tribal ruling rulers, they want to make the Shia minority. So whoever comes from outside working the police and torturing, beating, killing, after a few years, they're awarding them citizenship. And this is creating a big problem going on in Bahrain. And I think this is one of the main reasons behind people protesting, because people feeling be marginalized, discrimination against them, and empowering uh, groups from other countries to, to raid their houses, to rob their things, to, to, to torture them, to arrest them. And this is very dangerous game Bahrain uh, playing, uh, and also it miss, I mean, uh, it's exploiting the migrant workers. Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, Robin Wright had to leave because she's catching a plane also, like uh, Roy Gottman. Hi. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, my name is Zach Ritter, and I'm a student at Georgetown, a perpetual student, so I'm also unemployed technically. Um, graduate student. Yeah, <laughs> um, and it's a question for Nabil. Um, and I study um, nonviolent resistance and particularly interested um, in the history of this. Um, and the cases that really come to mind to me are Hungary and Czechoslovakia in reference when we talk about Bahrain. And my knowledge of the Middle East is very limited. Um, but my question, I have a twofold question. Um, first, was it a surprise to the Bahraini youth movement when the Saudis and GCC des decided to intervene and assist the Bahraini government in repressing their own people? Um, and second, has that had a long-term psychological impact on the youth movement because you no longer just uh, have a move movement directed toward your own sovereign government, but you're also now caught in between a geopolitical game? And so, as we saw in Hungary, East Germany, Poland, or the Czechoslovakia, it's, it, they went underground for quite some time. So what are your expectations about protests and the type of resistance we could expect to see? I don't believe in working underground. That's why wherever I go and I ask people, when I'm there and you tweeting, keep my name in Twitter, so my government knows that I'm speaking about them. And also, at the same time, I want people to learn how to work uh, openly. Because when you work underground, here is the dangerous. Here, it, mistakes come. Nobody can see you, and you keep continue doing that. And that would maybe it will lead to violence. Most of the violence groups were working underground. But when you work openly, the ability to work, I mean, to be violent is a bit limited. Just for your information, Bahrain Revolution was the most peaceful revolution. We fought guns with roses, and we are not planning to kill our killers, no. We're planning to take them to justice. We, th we want to build our country. We want to build our future. We want to build our nation. We believe in democracy. We believe, uh, believe in a human being. So we want to have a, a country that has justice. We don't believe in, and thanks God, most of people in the leadership level in my country, they don't believe in violence. That's why we could maintain the, the movement to be peaceful and it will remain peaceful. And I, I hope with all the frustration, it will remain peaceful. Yes, it was frightening, the Saudis' invasion to Bahrain. But what was more frightening is that Western countries, uh, including United States, 
which say give help to some countries uh, who uh, to, because the army killed their own people and they were quite in Bahrain. And with the, more than that, because they invited other army to take part in the crackdown, United Arab Emirates and the Saudi, they have taken part in the crackdown. Now you can, and they have two languages. This is the problem with the Western country. They have two languages. Very tough with Syria, which they have to be. Very tough with Libya, but when it comes to Bahrain, which does worse thing, they are very silent about it. Yes, it disappoints us. Yes, it makes people very upset. But we're going to continue on with our struggle, and we're going to win. Well, I, I just I just wanted to comment uh, on uh, Nabil's uh, response. I think I think it's completely uh, correct uh, this approach to stay uh, above the ground to uh, not to try uh, uh, to uh, reduce your movement uh, to just a club of uh, of uh, do-gooders or or a secret organization because then you will marginalize yourself and you may not have an opportunity to influence the general population. Although I, th I think what was meant in the question is uh, what you're going to do uh, if, uh, if it becomes completely impossible to do anything uh, openly, if, if uh, any kind of dissent will uh, make you a prisoner. I, I think this is, this, this is what was problematic. I think the late uh, Ayn Ratio says that uh, if there is somebody struggling for democracy and freedom, so there is a hope. So I believe there is a hope. <laughs> yes. David, did you have a yeah, question? Yeah. Uh, just uh, wait for the mic and please identify yours. Uh, Dave Ottaway, a senior scholar here. Nabil, a, a, a historical question. Uh, there, were a lot, there were a lot of political, there was an uprising in the early 90s. Um, and it went on for a number of years, and there were a lot of people killed, and you had a con the Shiites had a confrontation with the government. What parallels and non-parallels do you see between what happened then and what's happening now? I was uh, in the 90s in the street with people, and I am today in the street with people. Same people who were in the 90s, but today, of course, movement more educated. Today, with internet, with exchanging view. It's less extremism among everybody. It's more tolerant, uh, tolerant society now. With the exchange of uh, views through the internet and Facebook, I think we are one of the most active nation in the whole region on Facebook. And, and that helped us even improve ourselves, improve our langu language, improve our attitude, accept the others, accept the other beliefs, religion. That is, was not maybe as, the, as, as good as today in the 90s. But the same people who were in the 90s, today they were there. We were promised by the king that, yes, we're going to give you the, the parliament that you're fighting for. Yes, we're going to implement the constitution. Everything that you demand is going to be met. But unfortunately, the man, after two years, he changed his mind. Why he changed his mind, I don't know. And that's why today people in the street, it's just because the king changed his mind and gave us uh, an institution that has no power to legislate or monitor. Corruption is going on. Human rights violation continues. We've seen no changes. The situation of Shia has become worse during this uh, parliament. So uh, because he did not keep the promises, that's why today we have seen the same people are out, because those promises were not made. And I'm sure today, I mean, tomorrow, if we have a solution, political solution, people are going to, even those people who are talking about overthrowing the government, they will revise that idea once they see a real reform is being uh, introduced inside Bahrain. Uh, the lady Thank you. I'm Juliana Pilan. I teach at the Institute of World Politics. Uh, first, just a quick comment about uh, about tactics. Uh, I'm from Romania. In fact, I knew Mr. Yoratsu quite well. Uh, and as Oleg pointed out, in a truly authoritarian slash totalitarian context, you cannot be uh, out in the open. Iran is a case in point. And my question, very brief. I had hoped that Ms. Wright might be here too, but perhaps I can, perhaps I can address, uh, ask um, uh, our distinguished director, Ms. Estenpari. Uh, do you think that part of the reason the 2009 uprising um, revolt in Iran failed, and it, 
it didn't fail completely. Uh, it's clearly had an enormous effect elsewhere, but fizzled and so on. Was the tepid response from the United States? Um, Mandy? I'm not an expert in Iran. No, just uh, it concerned you. Yeah, this I think there was a, I mean, fail, fail on what? I mean, I don't know. They haven't a specific demand at that time. The Iranian <coughs> were out to overthrow the regime, but they have a demand about the election. And will they fail? And I always th I look at things positively. I said they would have not failed because we have learned from them a lot. We have learned how to use the social media and how to make out of this tool active and to be in the street. But now are they fail? Maybe I'm not an expert. In, uh, in that field. Uh, just very brief in one sentence. The protest movement in Iran started after the uh, presidential election, which were manipulated in 2009. And basically, it was a peaceful movement uh, asking, where is my vote? You know, and then once the government unleashed its forces on the protesters, then where is my vote turned into the death to the dictator and it escalated. And uh, finally, because of the sheer number of force, it uh, subsided. But um, I mean, the green movement in Iran is dormant. It's not dead. So, um, I am told I can take one last question by um, <coughs> the boss there. Can may I go to someone else? You have Nabil to your Yes, the lady there. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Devra Buckley. Um, I'm no, both jobless and homeless. So, uh, but soon to be moving to back to Romania and uh, La Muzan, Romania. Today, Romania, Romania Day. Uh, my question has to do with the comments made about uh, social networking and how it's worked in a variety of ways in these various countries and in, in um, motivating and getting people to take action. We are, uh, I'm going back to Romania to work on a project having t trying to do just that, motivate and really appeal to the young people to take action in their democracy. It's specifically voter education um, related. So my question to you is if you could, you said that you learned how to use it and have it work. So I would like to know your thoughts about and suggestions perhaps of how, what you thought did work about it. Was it short messages? Um, earlier, um, Robin mentioned comedy, um, film. Is, were, are there any things that you could share in terms of how to make those media work to really mo motivate and get young people to take action. I, one final comment. In our country, that population is on Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. But they, in the, in the voting population, they make up the smallest percentage of voters. So I was also curious in terms of how that, the actions that are taken by that population. Any, anybody on the panel would be great. I don't know if, uh, if, we, if we do it applies in Romania, but uh, uh, I think uh, any statement by unknown person in Twitter in my country, it will be taken uh, more seriously than a statement of a minister in Bahrain TV. It has more credibility. Uh, so it's a credibility of the uh, news, uh, and also uh, they need to know something in you. I'll give you an example of myself. I am, uh, uh, again, because of my work, I'm a news provider. I bring the news from here, from there, which even if it comes in the newspaper, it will come next day. So I give, I, I try my best to make a credible news, to post credible news. People by that, they see you credible news and some opinion. I give my opinion, they like it and they follow it. They follow you day by day, day by day. Besides also what I've done, I force people to come, tactics I've used, I force people to use Twitter and Facebook. You, you, before I used to go to some website and post something, then I stop. I said, whoever want to see what I'm writing, all news go to Twitter and Facebook. So I met thousands of people go and have membership in Twitter and Facebook, and we have a lot of Bahrainis today. But credibility, I think, uh, credibility is much more important because politicians in our region, I think in most of the world, uh, most, uh, a lot of them are liars. <laughs> a 
just briefly, uh, Karen? Uh, I'd just like to say that, um, interestingly, uh, the Bahraini government also tweets, and very aggressively, and they, they, they treat, uh, um, they give uh, tweet responses to tweeters like him. And in Saudi Arabia, um, it's common knowledge that members of the intelligence are monitoring uh, Twitter, and sometimes they um, sign up, but they never show their faces. They don't put their picture. So all you get is the oval-shaped white egg. So um, the Saudis call them the egg people. Um, yeah, just, just uh, uh, a few words in addition. Uh, to what Nabil said, that uh, the message should be credible. I think it also should be personal, uh, to the extent uh, possible. It should be emotional, and uh, in, in the best case, uh, it should uh, relate to uh, important values, uh, sometimes maybe existential uh, values, and then it can have a, a viral effect. Um, we are going to uh, take a 15 uh, minute break and then uh, you will have a chance to listen to much more what that Nabil has to say. Fourth time, giving, for the fourth time today. His speech and the meeting will be hosted by and chaired by Christian Osterman, the director of the history and public policy program at the Wilson Center who has been putting together every year this wonderful event. Please join me in thanking the panelists.